Oh, what's happening? Um, yeah, that's still on there. And that might be better. Sorry. Well, darn it. <laughs> start over. I'm going to start all over. Are you ready? Hey, everyone. I think that's how I kind of started it. Something like that. Uh, I, had, I had it on the wrong, uh, the wrong thing. I actually still had it on my phone, which is just looking at a piece of paper. So sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so week eight, I'll say it all over again because I'll cut that first part off uh, when YouTube allows me to do an edit. So week eight, week one, eight weeks felt like a very daunting um, endeavor, but it went by pretty quickly. Um, I don't know if it went by quickly for you, but it's flown by for me. It always seems when you look back, it always seems like things happen so quickly, but when you're looking ahead, sometimes everything seems so far away or so big. But uh, yeah, so it's been a lot of fun. And um, tonight's the last night. I'm sad, but I'm excited because it's been, it's been really good. So uh, especially with the free motion stuff, I, I love to teach all aspects of long arm quilting. Um, I do have a list of videos that I plan to try and get filmed and, you know, produced um, and put up that aren't live to start with, but I am a one pony show. So I am the videographer and the editor and the producer and the come up of the ideas and all that kind of stuff. I'm the only one who does any of that. So uh, it does take a lot of time. And I have to kind of balance it with everything that I do here and at home and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a lot, but I do love doing it. So uh, hopefully I can get some of those up. Um, I know we didn't talk about tension. We will do that. Um, I'll pop in here on a live. I don't know when. I will pop in here on a live or maybe I'll just do a proper video. Um, but I like the live because then you can ask questions and it's more interactive. So we'll see. Anyways, tonight we're going to uh, do a few things. We're going to add that leaf to a curl. Hopefully you've all been doodling all week and working on your curls and coming over the top and making sure you go all the way in and all that kind of stuff. And traveling, changing direction. When you come out of the curl, you have to stop change direction and fall down the flow of the curve to do the next one, to do the next curl. Uh, and then we're going to embellish. Last week we did the flowers. Um, and this week we're going to add a leaf. And we're also going to start looking at working off a spine. We're going to do leaves, curls, and we are going to look at feathers. Now, before everybody gets all excited and freaks out or gets all intimidated and worried, we're going to just do simple, sweet little long arm feathers. We're not, we're not going to do any big flourishing Amish feathers, no heirloom feathers, nothing bumping back, all that kind of stuff. We're just going to keep it real simple and eventually we will get there, right? My philosophy is baby step your way to the top. We don't expect babies to start running out of the gate, right? They have to learn to roll over, then they have to learn to sit, push up and sit up and all that kind of stuff. So same thing when you're free motion quilting and you're learning skills, not all of us are um, born magnificent drawers or artists or anything like that. For me, this is a completely learned skill. I've just spent a ton of time doodling and drawing and spending hours and hours and hours and hours and hours at the machine. I just worked for it. So I, I don't have any special talents. It's just, it's just a lot of practice and a lot of will to want to be um, proficient. Okay. But the more proficient you get, the more creative you're going to get. The more comfortable you get making these simple shapes will allow you to expand and try new things and add more elements and before you know it I promise you you're going to be creating these like huge monstrous designs that are look that just look so complicated but really aren't when you break them down and you look at them in individual steps okay all right so enough of that let's get drawing hope everybody's got your books now I will say I have mentioned a couple of times a handout it started out to be just a couple of pages 
but it is me. And it's turned into a 32 page booklet. I thought it was 36, but apparently I can't count. So it's 32 pages. Um, it is available on my website. It's everything we've done in the last three weeks. Uh, it walks us through all of it. There's a lot of extra stuff in here that we didn't talk about. Uh, variations in designs, um, different ways to add things, like just extras that we haven't gotten to with the live. So for anybody who would like this, it's on my website. I'm sure Jesse's already thrown down the link there. Uh, and it'll be in the descriptions uh, below. After this is not live anymore, it'll be in a description. And if you want to go and grab this, it's $7.99 Canadian. So for those of you who think in American dollars, it's about six bucks. All right. Uh, again, it, it got a little, a little more than what it had intended to be, but I'm not going to lie. If the last couple of weeks of my personal life hadn't been so chaotic, this probably would have ended up being about 120 pages long. So I had to stop somewhere. Uh, but that is up and available on the website now. Okay. And it's just basically everything that we've done and guides and arrows and do this first and don't do that. And this is what happens and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to grab that, grab it. That'd be great. If you don't, that's okay too. Okay. All right, so we're going to add a leaf to a curl. Um, I, have my, I have my dry erase markers in one pocket. Or no, these are my flip chart markers in this pocket. And my dry erase markers over here. Hopefully I, <laughs> hopefully I won't. You never know. It is me. I quite often find myself on the struggle bus. And that's just the way it is. So if I happen to use the wrong marker, I use the wrong marker. It'll be okay. All right, so we're going to add a leaf to a curl. Now, it's the same thing as we did last week with a flower. And I'll use black. What I want you to think about with this leaf, though, is, and hopefully I can explain this again without sounding like brain surgery, as you come in and you come back out over the top of of the curl, right? So you come on the outside because that's how it's easiest to travel. You have to start to think when you're doing this, you have to start to think a little bit ahead of where you are in the moment, right? When we're driving a car, we're not looking at the front of our hood. At least I hope we're not. We're looking down the road a little bit, right? So we know where to go. Eyes up. We're looking ahead. So where I decide to stop and drop this leaf on this curl is going to determine where I'm going next, what direction I'm going next. So the way I should have said it actually is you can determine where you want to go by how far out of the curl you come when you make the leaf. You are also going to decide which direction you want to go by doing one side of the leaf first or another. I know that didn't sound, I know that sounded complicated. Let me show you. And that's my fault, it's not complicated. So when I did this one, and can you see? I'm gonna bring this real close. I had somebody uh, last week tell me that they couldn't see my drawing and that it was fuzzy and it was too dense. So we'll see how we go. There we go, can you see okay? All right. So. If I'm coming in my curl and I want my next sort of one to sort of come up here, as I come out, I've got my leaf is facing in this direction. I do the underside first and then come over, pop my little vein in, and then I travel with my echo over that way. That automatically puts me on the trajectory to come up this way and follow around and do a curl that way, okay? If I wanted to do the same thing but come sort of either this way or down here, as I've come out of my curl, I've stopped a little bit sooner. See, I'm here I came all the way out to here, and on this one I only came out to here. I've popped the leaf in there exactly the same way. I've done this side first, 
so I end up on this side of the leaf. So I'm still coming out of the curl, but instead of being way up here, sort of on a path to go that way, I'm here. So I could actually just, I could either come up and swing it here, or I could come and um, change direction here and sort of come down and around, right? This one here puts me behind my curl. So if I come in on the curl, come out on the outside, I've popped my leaf on the top, done my vein, and then I'm all the way over here. So naturally, I'm going to want to swing my next one up and back there, okay? Now these ones down here, I've done them in the same, everything's facing the same way, but I've gone on the opposite side of the leaf to stitch it, so I end up on the other side, okay? I'll just explain it. Come in, as I come out on this one, I came out and I did this side of the leaf first, right? And then by going that way, it put me up there. On this one, I've come in and I've done the leaf here and then come back down here. So now my line is going that way instead of that way. Okay, same thing with this one. All I've done is flip the side that I start the leaf on. So as I come out, instead of doing that side and bringing my travel line out here, I've stopped, swung my S curve in, brought my leaf in there with my vein, and I've headed that way. That's gonna put me in here somewhere, which would then make me wanna go sort of down in that way, okay? This one, same thing. The leaf's pretty much in the same direction. It's still facing up. This curl is still facing this way. But as I come out, I go past it, do this S curve, come in, do my vein, pop out. And now I'm sliding down this way instead of heading that way. Okay? I know it's a lot to think about, but once you start doing it, you're actually going to start doing it subconsciously. And it won't seem like so much so much to think about. You'll just be sort of doing it. You'll get comfortable. Again, it's kind of like driving. You know, you're driving along and all of a sudden you, you get somewhere and you think, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what I was thinking about because I don't really remember getting here. That kind of thing. Um, you'll start doing it naturally and without having to overthink everything, okay? The, the secret is in the doodling. Just, just doodle it. It's just paper. It's just a pen, right? Keep doing it and experiment and flip them. Okay. All right. I'm going to come back a little bit now. Actually, maybe I should have stayed there. This is in the booklet as well. I will come forward again. I do have the focus locked on that, so it shouldn't be it shouldn't be doing this. Okay, that one lady said it was blurry, but I don't know if it was or not. All right, so now this is actually pretty much life size. All right, I know it's kind of hard sometimes when you see, like in the booklet, when you see all the drawing and the drawing is all like this big. A couple of people have asked me, you know. Do I, am I supposed to doodle at the same scale as I would stitch? No. Um, I know that in the drawings, everything looks dense, but I'm only working on an eight by 10 inch piece of paper. If when I'm drawing on something this big, it allows me to draw bigger and have more elements in it because I have a bigger space to draw on. But this actual size, so if you look at my hand, there's about my fist. That's a really nice life size um, size for these curls. This dense is quite, or this design is quite dense, uh, but it would travel across um, a good size quilt and not be too much quilting, depending, of course, on the um, piecing. Uh, but it's not too tight either. I like more quilting than less quilting, but that's just me as well. Okay. So I started way up here. And I came into my curl, came into my curl, came out, 
just like in the first page there, as I came out, I only come to here because I actually wanted the next curl to come straight down and be down here. So I swung in, did my leaf, angled in my um, vein. Now here, I was headed this way, but I didn't want to keep going that way. So all I did was stop, change directions, and come this way, just like we did last week with the curls, when we were just doing curls. Not every single curl has to have a leaf on it, and you can change directions whenever you like, okay? As I did that, I popped in a little curl here, and there's actually another curl here with no leaf attached. I came out and changed direction, popped into there to just sort of do a little bit of an echo, and then went up, and then I end up over here, okay? So on and so forth. There is a drawing in the handout that talks about this, okay? I want to expand on and get into the spine and the feathers and the shapes and all that kind of stuff. So that's all the time we're going to spend on this. Otherwise, we'll all be here till midnight. But that's a great design and it looks good and it's easy. You can do it tiny like a little filler. You can do it big as an edge to edge. Whatever, just make it work within your space, okay? I mentioned uh, last week when I was talking, I was talking about, uh, oh, I didn't really talk about it. I said the term spatial awareness and somebody said, what do you mean by that? So I guess what I mean is, because I had to think about what I meant when she asked me the question. I know where I'm going and I know how much room I have and what I want to fill in that space. It just comes as part of the, you know, the scale. So as I start to get more into here and I've got this, I wanted to come this way, I'm aware of how much space is there. So I start just sort of naturally poking in a little echo and a bounce out because, you know, maybe I don't, I know instinctively that I don't have enough space in here for too much. So it got a smaller curl. I didn't put the leaf in there because I knew I didn't have the space. So it's just sort of as you're dancing around the quilt, you're going to be aware of what spaces are coming, what spaces you've left, you know, as you sort of dance away from your area and you kind of start to come back in that meander fashion. You'll start to know, okay, I've got a little bit of room there. I'll just pop a curl in and pop back out. Does that make sense? Yeah, does that make sense to you? Okay, I think that's the best way that I can really explain it and it will come. If you haven't got it yet, it will come. The more you doodle and play uh, in your sketchbooks, it'll start to come, okay? All right, we're gonna work off a spine. We are not going to do big flourishing um, border designs tonight. But I do want you to start to understand what it means to work off a spine. And what I'm going to show you is going to work with any design. Curls, leaves, feathers. Look at some of my videos. I've created the most wacky designs popping off a spine. And really, your imagination is the only limit that you have. All right? So I think there is a playlist. Jesse will have to confirm that for me. Um, I'm pretty sure there is a playlist that says feather alternatives or something like that. Everything in that playlist is off a spine. I've got things that look like baseball mitts and soccer balls and peacock feathers and all manner of, of odd looking things. Um, but they're all done with the same principles as what I'm going to show you now, okay? And when you see it, if you don't already understand this concept, for those of you who are really new, when you see it, you're going to have that little light bulb moment. And you're going to think, oh, now I know why my feathers don't look like feathers and they look like soggy hot dogs hanging off my spine. I have a visual of that in a little bit. It's pretty funny. But it happens. Everybody does it. Okay. So we're going to start with our straight spine and we're going to start with curls. All right. A few sort of rules. They can see all my writing, right? No, they can't. 
Okay. That's okay, because I'm. It, what's down here doesn't really matter, as long as I can see it. Um, when we're working about, when we're working on a spine, I want you to think of driving, and I want you to think of how you get onto a highway, or for those of you in United States, a freeway, I think that's what you call it. Here we call it a highway. When we get on the highway and off the highway, there's no right turns, there's no sharp angles. We slide on and merge onto the highway, right? So we come down the ramp, and before we actually hit the highway, we're running parallel with the traffic, correct? As we get off the highway, again, there's no right corners, there's no 90 degree angles. We come off the exit ramp and we slowly, slowly slide off the highway and go up onto the exit ramp, correct? The same applies right here, no matter what shape you're doing. So with this curl, and I really hope that they can see that close up. With this curl, I'm running on the spine, and then I slide off it to go out to do my curl. When I come back, I'm going to merge. So before my curl actually hits the spine, the line is already in line with the spine coming down. Okay? When you look at any of my designs, and you can go and look at the videos or you know, what we do here tonight, it's a very small angle right here, right there, okay? It comes over and it slides on. I always do the underside first of the design, doesn't matter what design it is, because I want coming over the top of the design to help me travel up the spine, okay? If we do the underside first, what's going to happen is we're going to have to cross over ourselves. And then the first thing it's going to do is make the spine really messy because you're going to have thread, right? It's one thing when you're drawing, but when you're on a quilt, especially depending what kind of thread you're using. I mean, if you're using a 40 weight variegated thread, you do not want to see all the way up the spine because it's going to get really thready and it's going to get really messy and it just, it won't look nice. All right. So we are going to travel. Sharpie dry erase. Put that one away. Can they see okay? Yeah. yeah. So there's my spine. And right now we're just going to stick with straight. I'm going to slide up the spine just a little bit and I'm going to slide off, do my curl, going to come in over the top and before I get to the spine I'm going to make sure that I'm almost running parallel with it. When I do the next one, same thing. Curl up over the top, and down. Up and out and over, up over the top, and down. Slide up, bottom of the curl. Now I'm leaving space in between this curl and the top of this one because I need room to get out, okay? So as I swing around here, when I echo that, that's going to get me closer, all right? So depending on how fat you're doing these curls is going to be how much room you need to leave as you swing around so you've got room to get out, okay? And each one's going to be different too, so like don't overthink that either. If I'm doing these and I'm sort of almost backtracking all the way like this, then they're going to touch because that's what I'm looking for. I want them to touch. Have the spatial awareness to know how much room you need to get out and if you want space or if you don't want space. Okay? All right. When we're doing a leaf, it's the same thing. The leaf is just the S curve, right? Whether it's a long skinny leaf that looks like a fern or you're sort of doing a, 
You want some kind of watery business where you're just sort of, sort of wiggling it up like this and wiggling it back. The same principle applies. We're going to slide off the spine. We're going to come back over the top here, over the top and land back on the spine. We're going to merge onto it with not much angle in there. All right. Now, especially with these leaves, what I want you to notice is how much space this leaf takes up on the spine. I'm traveling up the spine, on, off, or off on, okay? Up. So there's a huge amount of space here to help it travel up the edge. If you bring these to a point at the bottom, they're going to look like, I think we discussed this, uh, discussed this a couple weeks ago, they're going to just look like they're just like hanging on for their life just by a little, a little thread, right? And they won't, it won't fill the space on the spine and they'll just sort of look odd and spindly and you'll end up with not enough room either to put the leaves up the top because you'll have to go keep going up and down the spine again to travel to the next spot where you can actually have room to put one. I'll explain that better with a drawing. Do you have a question? Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Um, Sue's asking, are you stitching spines first or are they being made as you stitch the curls instead? Ah, good question. So Sue asked if I stitch the spine first or if I make the spine as I'm stitching um, the design. Every, everyone is different. Some, generally, if I'm doing this in a border, I, I may stitch the spine first, but you can actually, you can do it where um, you don't even use a spine and the design can get so dense as it comes together that if you just put a chalk line and you start building heavier designs. So with these curls, Honestly, I would want a spine with those curls because, you know, they're kind of, they're not really fat at the bottom. You can make them fat at the bottom, but a nice beefy design like a leaf. Like this, if you just chalk that in because you don't necessarily want to stitch a spine, if you um, just chalk it in, by the time you come up, and you come down and put your vein in, and then you go up here, the eye will actually close it. And you'll, you won't notice that there's not a spine there because there's a lot right, right on there. Does that make sense? Um, the, uh, sometimes when I'll do the little feathers with sort of on a spine as a filler design, I stitch the spine and then I stitch down the spine, like I kind of stitch up and I stitch back, and then I swing my feathers on the top, echo back, and then I swing them on the bottom. Can you remind me to show them that afterwards? That's not, that's not in my presentation, so I may have to be reminded. And I'll show you how to do that. What um, filler feather. Okay. Yeah, I'll remember. All right, so each, each situation is going to be different, basically. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about that, about leaving the space for, the, for, the, uh, for coming out of the design up and over. So you'll have to be conscious of that when you're doing this type of thing. Anything with um, curls, no matter what's on here, whether it's a, a razor wire or a ribbon curl or sort of a peacocky thing. Um, again, check out my playlist of my feather variations. There's all kinds of stuff, all kinds of stuff. We want to keep this, the bases of the leaves tight to make sure we create fullness and it will avoid this. Can they see that? I'm going to draw it up here. So these are things that I see a lot when I'm teaching students in the shop or when I used to teach students in the shop before, you know, the thing that should not be named uh, came along. So if you're stitching your, your leaves 
in particular, say. And I'm coming up and instead of having that nice fat base there that's taking up all this space, I bring the bottom to here And I'm not talking about thick leaves and thin leaves because these leaves can be as long and thin as you like. They still, you still don't want them to come right to a point when they get to the um, spine because no matter how skinny they are, if you come right to a point, you won't have room to pop the next one on top of it. You're going to end up with gaps and spaces. Okay. So I did those and then now I've got this. So if I do another one and I come back and then I do this and I come back, see what I mean? So it, it's kind of hard for me to create it, but it, it happens. So when, you've, when you're not coming onto it with some space in the middle, so even if that's really skinny, I still have that much space. Does that make sense? Hopefully, are they? That's what you want. And this is what we want. We want this space. See right here, this one here, this came off the spine right here and it came back on the spine right there. There's, there's no, um, the spine's not being eaten up anywhere. So eventually this will compound itself, the compound theory, uh, and it'll just get worse with every leaf you add. It'll just exasperate the next one and it'll get it just gets you can't control it at that point it just gets awful okay all right this is what happens here if we don't merge all right and I know you probably can't see it but it's okay I'm going to draw it So, I slide off, oops, it's hard to control my marker standing up here, and my, I don't know if it's because I didn't get the really, really expensive one, but this thing, <laughs> when I go to draw on it, it kind of, it kind of, just kind of wavers a little bit, so, anyway, just an excuse. All right, slide up, off, back, take up space. Take up space, merge on. Okay, everything's looking good. Next one. Okay, now if we start to stop the merge and we start kind of hitting that at the wrong angle, this happens real fast when we start to do feathers. So I'm going to come off here. I'm not really going to slide off very good. I'm just kind of coming on an angle there. And when I come back, I've come back sort of on, I don't know, like a 30 degree angle. I don't know what that is. It doesn't matter. But there's a lot of space right here, okay? Right there. It doesn't look nice and tight like this, and this is not sliding onto the spine. So as we start to stitch and we start to do that, it's going to compound it for the next one, and that angle's going to get flatter, and that angle's going to get fatter, and then, see, now I have to, now I have to actually physically slide down my, my spine to get to here to be able to do the next one. But I'm already sort of in this kind of manner of travel. Once this is started, it's really hard to get that nice merge back. So then it starts to go like this. And then things are, then just things just, it just goes in the trash after that, if that makes sense. So it's really important, pardon? No, it's really important that you think tuck, think tuck and roll, you know? Like if you get kicked out of a car, and you, <laughs> you jump out of a car and you got to tuck and roll before you hit the ground. It's the same thing. As you hit the, <laughs> oh, I'm going to get the giggles now. Oh dear. 
No, no, it's never good. So as you come in with a curl, as you come here, tuck, okay? If it's a leaf, tuck, right? Just think that. Okay, everybody got that so far? We good? Does it, are there any questions there? No? Not yet. Okay. Are there people there? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm <laughs> talking to my camera. Okay. Da, da, da. Feathers. These are simple feathers. Um, nothing heirloomy, like I said earlier. Uh, we're not doing fancy Amish feathers or bump back feathers, the traditional ones or whatever. We're just going to do some simple long arm feathers. They are basically a paisley shape, and they are worked from bottom to top, all right? When we work heirloom feathers or bump back feathers, they're worked over the top first, and then you backtrack, and you come up over the top, over the top, bump back over the top. These guys are under and up, under and up, all right? I want you to think of a paisley shape um, or I don't know, some people see a tadpole. I basically just see a paisley shape. Don't overthink them, all right? What you do want is a nice S curve. We've got that S curve again. Sharpie. Right here. We've got that S curve up and over. And then this is just an arc. So S curve, S curve. Round it out, arc, S-curve, arc, S-curve, arc. Where this usually goes wrong is people fail to go, to, fail to go in here, and then they get kind of um, hot doggy looking. I have a drawing back here. I'll show you in a minute. All right. So S-curve in, you're going to swing in just like you're doing a leaf, but you're going to round it out nicely. Do an arc and come all the way back. Again, get used to doing this shape in every direction. No turning your paper, no turning your sketchbooks, because as you're dancing around the quilt, we're going to put it on a curl. You're going to need your brain to know how to swing that up and out to get yourself around, whether it's going on a curl or a spine or whatever it is you're doing. Okay? All right. So you're going to practice those. Again, the inside first, no matter what direction it is. So in and out, in and out, doesn't, doesn't matter. You're always going to do the, the S curve first and then the arc, okay? Now we're going to swing it on a curl and I know you can't see my drawing at the bottom there but it's okay. I'm going to back this up a little bit. Do you have a question? Sure, okay. go ahead. Hannah? Hi, Hannah. Um, she said, do you always alternate sides up the spine? Yes, if, if I'm doing, um, Hannah asked if I always alternate sides going up a spine. If I'm working in a border, say, and I have a nice undulating spine, whether it's chalked in or, or stitched in, I bounce back and forth between the two sides. Uh, when you're doing this as a filler, you can, and I'll show you with the feathers. Can you remind me, echo feather? It's not in the presentation, but I'll show you. Um, if I'm doing it as a feather, or as a, as a filler, sort of, I will, I will go up. I'll show you. I'll stitch up the spine and then kind of pop myself back down. And then I'll work my feathers up the one side. And then I generally tend to echo myself back and then pop them up the other side because my, I've left sort of a vein in there. So there's a space. So I can't bounce back and forth. Um, if you're doing a nice big border where you do have that vein look in your spine, so your spine is open, um, I don't know if it's, a, if it's a really popular thing now, but I remember several years ago it was a big thing to have the spines open with like pebbles or, you know, whatever manner of filler inside them. So it was really open there. 
and you had a whole other element, that you have to stitch one side and then get yourself back either by echo or stop and start to do the other side. But if your spine is singular and it's just one line, you can absolutely just keep bouncing yourself up and I walk my way, I walk my way up it. All right, again, I sound like a broken record. Check out the playlists of the feather alternatives because I'm bouncing back and forth all the time. I was never one to do those open spines. I think I probably did a few, um, but it just kind of wasn't really my thing. I liked it, it looked nice, but I just never really did it. So in that instance, yes, you would do just one side and then you could, you could go up the one side and then work your way back doing the filler in the space in the spine and then work your way up the other side of the spine. So you could do that too. All right, so we're gonna add this, these feathers onto this little curl. Can they see me okay? Yeah. I'm gonna swing my way in. Now this is similar to, uh, similar to the flower in that these feathers are going to walk their way. We're gonna come out, but we're gonna come all the way out and we're gonna walk our way around the curl with the feathers. So we're going to have space. And I know I haven't got to that, uh, I haven't got to that thing yet. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna go right back to here first. Here we go. I'll come back. We'll come back to this one in a second. Here we go. So this is that pearl. There we go. This is the pearl on a spine. And again, these are not the heirloom ones. These are just the simple feathers, all right? I'm gonna slide from the bottom. I'm gonna slide up the spine, travel off it, swing my feather up and over. And then by the time I hit the spine, I'm already parallel with it. So I'm merging onto it, okay? You don't have a lot of space here. It's very important that you don't allow this to get on that angle like I showed you with the leaf because it goes south really fast with feathers. We've got a ton of space along this spine. It doesn't matter if the spine's straight, curved, a curl, I don't know, an inverted flying goose, doesn't matter what, what shape it is. The feather has to have space so it can travel up wherever it is that you're going. Um, I don't know, even if you wanted to put them traveling up the inside of a ditch and popping them into a square, they still have to take up space in that area so that they can travel. Make sense? All right. So if we look here, this is pretty simple, nothing fancy. I started here. This one swings out and up and over here. And by the time I touch the spine, I'm like right there. I have this much space. Okay, the merge is really important, like I said. You know what, I'll just show it to you now. This is what happens when they go wrong. I started out off okay, or I started out okay. And then right about here, I didn't merge properly. It was very slight, but if you, if you can actually see that, hopefully you can, I didn't, tuck and roll. Like I said, it's not tucked in there. What happens is when you do that, it makes the next one worse. So at that point, now I'm coming in like that. So I'm obviously doing the same thing on this side because I've now I'm, I'm swinging and I'm not thinking. Because I went in on an angle there and I didn't tuck it, it doesn't allow me to come off the spine by sliding. Now I have to get off it because this is in my way. Does that make sense? And every feather you do thereafter, just, it just gets worse. And then they don't look like feathers anymore. Now they just look like hot dogs or something. And they just don't, <laughs> they just don't look pretty. So you really have to, <laughs> 
you really have to merge the feathers to make sure that they stay in nice shape. Paisley, 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 all right? They're not coming to a point, but they do have to come and tuck, okay? All right. I'll be a grown-up again. I'm going to draw something. All right, so when I do my curl, I come in, and I actually want, it doesn't matter if you only want your feathers just on the edge of your curl, then you're only going to backtrack or echo to wherever you want to be. When I do this, I tend to go almost all the way back because I like it to almost look like a little feather motif rather than sort of a flower. So I'm going to echo my way back, come up and over, all the way to somewhere here. This can be open. It could be completely backtracked. It could be a ribbon curl. Whatever curl you're doing, it, that's going to alternate. So as soon as I get to here, then I'm going to swing my feathers in. All right? So swing in, S curve, arc, merge. This is automatically an S curve because I'm following the curve of the feather before it. And that is how that other mess starts to happen. Because you have to follow the curve of the one before it to do the next one. So as soon as you start not merging here and you start coming in on an angle, it's going to throw everyone off after that. Right? All right. So we're going to swing them out, merge in, swing it out, Merge in. Just keep thinking paisley. S-curve, arc. S-curve, arc. I like to start to let them come out a little bit further. It's sort of, um, I don't know. It sort of looks like, um, what's the bird? The Beretta bird. You know, when they puff up their feathers and they're in the front. Cockatoo? Pardon? Cockatoo? No, you know that white Beretta bird? Cockatoo? Is it a cock oh, cockatoo? Cockatoo? Okay. Hmm. Somebody tell me, somebody out there knows. You know what I mean, when they fluff out their feathers and they get that, like that, that big um, plume. That's what this kind of reminds me of. So you can just keep swinging out. As far as you want. So you can come just to here, or you can just keep swinging. It depends on the look that you're going for. So stop whenever you like. But what you don't want to do is start doing this. See what happens? As soon as I stop tucking that in, they don't look like feathers anymore. They lose that S curve, that nice tight coming into almost a point. So we'll quickly do a new one and then we'll travel. This is basically what we're going to do here. We are going to come out, spin our feathers all the way around, and then I'm going to bounce back with my echo. You don't have to echo every single feather. Just echo back as far as you want to go because you're already thinking, where am I going next? As soon as I plop that in there, this echo is going to decide, or I'm going to decide where I want to go by how far back I echo. So if I wanted to come up here and head that way, I will come all the way back to here. If I wanted the next one to sort of swing out from here, I don't know, swing down and come this way, maybe. I'm only going to come to here. Maybe I only go to there. Every feather is going to be different. Every, every curly feather is going to have a different number of feathers. Don't count them like the flowers. I know last week I said three and five for petals. One, three, five, seven looks really good. Um, but with these things, honestly, there's so many on here. Don't get hung up on how many there are. Don't worry. It's not all clustered in one little curl that's meant to look sort of like a circle when it's finished. Let it be what it is. If you've got five, ten, four, six, it, it, it'll all be okay. All right? So on this one, I came in, 
came on the outside all the way to here. I've left a space just because I like that look. It looks, um, it just gives it a little more, um, like, what's the word? Personality. Well, it just makes it a little more, like a little more hefty. You know what I mean? Not as delicate. Um, but if I was, I don't know. I don't know. I don't overthink it. I just do it. So some may have it and some may not, and I don't care. There'll be some in there that have a space all across a quilt and some won't. It all looks good together and it just makes it more interesting, right? So I swing my feathers all the way down. I like to come all the way to here usually, or, you know, I'll tuck them right in, right into the front if I've got room and I feel like it needs, the space needs to be filled. Spatial awareness. If I felt that this space was too big, I would keep going. So I could get a couple more in there, so it's a little more dense in there. If I want something loose and more open, I'm not going to go in so far. Okay? So I echo back, and then I'm swinging myself way down in here, come back on the outside, and then I'm swinging those feathers all the way in. S curve arc, S curve arc, as far as I want to go. I know I need room to echo to echo this, so you know I didn't want to maybe come in too far here because then my echo may get too close to that line. So I stop there, bounce my way back, and then swing in the next one and just keep traveling. Okay? So we'll try it. Does somebody have a question? No. Okay. Is everything okay? Yep. Okay. Swing it out. Swing it out. Swing it out. Somebody asked me last week if the if the tips of my petals touched my curl and I couldn't find one. I think I found one that did. When I'm stitching these, I don't think I actually touch very often um, this thing here. If you want to, if you want to slide right on that spine and touch it, that's fine. If you're nice and close, the eye will automatically close it. So don't worry about not touching it. If there's a little space, you won't see it later. Okay. Swing, swing, swing it out, swing it out, swing it out, swing it out. Let's do one little one. Ah, we'll put one more little one right there. Got a little smaller as I came in. Then I'm going to echo my way out. If I want to go down here, I'm going to stop maybe here and I'll swing in my next one. But if I want to go up there, then I'm going to keep echoing. Till I get to wherever I want to go. So let's echo up to here, maybe to there, and then I'll just swing back down and put one right here. Swing them round, swing them round, swing them round. Like that. Tuck a little one there. If you look, I don't know if you can see it on the camera. I left a space here. I don't care. It's fine. The rest of them are tucked. I prefer them if they're tucked. But if I've got one or two where there happens to be a little space, as long as this is following the line of the one before it and it doesn't look like broken off or anything, just leave it. Just leave it. They don't have to be perfect. Let them, just let them be. pop my way back out as far as I want to go. Maybe I'm going to go down here now. I'll put a little one here. Again, not every single one of these needs to have feathers on it. Throw in just some regular curls if you don't want it as dense. If this gets really dense, whether you stitch it out this big as a filler or whether you stitch it out this big as a full-on edge-to-edge design, um, it it is quite dense, so it is a bit of a commitment when you're doing it. Um, but like I said, you could do mostly curls across the quilt and then add these in sporadically every now and then. They don't have to be on every single curl. 
It's cute, right? It's really cute. It looks really nice stitched out too. Your stitching, as I've said before, your stitching is always going to look better than your drawing and your doodling. So is that your echo feather? Is that your echo no. feather? No. No, that's not the echo feather. Okay. But that's good. I will show them that now. Because I've already showed them this, what goes wrong with your feathers and why they look like that. This is why, because you're not merging. Okay? And that's the end of what I have uh, written out. Does anybody have any questions before I show them that? No. No? You had filler feather as well. Filler feather, yeah. Okay. Does everybody like this design? It's really cute, hey? Gosh, I love quilting. I just love quilting. Just standing at the machine. I don't even have to be quilting a quilt. I just love the sound and the feel of the machine and you just put on a nice great big solid piece of fabric and some really pretty thread and just disappear into the abyss of creativeness <laughs> or whatever that sounded really stupid but you guys know what I mean right yeah okay so here's a cute little uh feather filler um so I would just start in like this and then I come back. I will usually leave a space. It doesn't have to be a big space or a little space. That's going to depend on how big or small it is. Okay. And then I'll just walk my way up here. Swing around, swing around, swing around. I get to about there and then I'm going to echo my way back. I cross over, never been arrested. I'll cross the line. That's a quilting thing. Lydia's like, <laughs> I hope you've never been arrested. There's a thing in the quilting world called the quilting police that we're not allowed to cross over lines and all these other silly rules. Um, I'll cross over here, right? And then I'll work this one. Sometimes I get right close to that spine. Sometimes I let these little feathers stick out a little bit. When I get to here, I'll echo my way as far as I want to go till I want to change direction. I'll put one here. So I spin out, back, work my feather. Oops, I'm not leaving that there. Sorry. Hang on. Tea game time. This board. You probably can't see it, but this board is like waving like a tree in the wind. There we go. Get to there. Echo. I'll get to here and I'll let myself cross over. Echo my way back. And then I may just sort of echo my way out. And what you want to do is make sure that you're changing, um, changing direction. So this one may actually just come down. All right. When I echo back, I've got a space there. This is a filler design, all right? If I'm doing this in a space as a background filler, I want it to be dense. I want it to be tight. I'm probably using um, 60, 80, or 100 weight thread when I'm doing a filler. So I'm getting texture. I'm not seeing a bunch of thread, all right? So it's okay for the design to be dense because the thread is a lightweight and we're just gonna see the, we're not gonna see the thread, we're just gonna see the texture, okay? So I'm going to bounce my way back. While I'm in here, I may want to just put a little something in there just to fill in the space a little bit. So I may just do this before I cross over. 
it just kind of fills it in so you don't all of a sudden have a bare spot that would stick out a little bit, right? Not a lot in there. Cross back over and send myself this way. Now, I may want to start to go up there somewhere. So there's nothing wrong with doing this. I've got that little flick, sort of like a leaf, and then I'll work my way up here. So this sort of answers both questions, right? Because I've got a space in my spine, I'm echoing my way back down and then just filling that in. I'm not going to bother going in there. It's already tight enough and by the time it's all done, nobody's going to know that that wasn't echoed and it'll be just fine. I don't want to get myself all the way in there because spatial awareness, I've got room to get in there, but to get out, it's going to be really crowded. I could do it. You could backtrack it or whatever, but you know what? That space is so small, we don't need to go in there. So I'll stop and I'll just back myself out. And so on and so forth. I like that. That looks beautiful stitched out, I promise you. It's, uh, it's not so pretty in black dry erase marker but it's beautiful on a quilt it's very um, delicate even though it's even though it's dense and sort of a heavy design it's a delicate design those little feathers and they just look really pretty on a quilt yeah okay it that's the same thing that's the echo feather that I mentioned um, and it's also got the space which is because I echo my way back um, it's kind of the same, kind of the same thing. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? It's just nine o'clock, five after nine. So we're good. If anybody's got any questions or has anything else to ask. Cindy asked, or Cindy said, that the first feather on her spine usually looks wonky. So here's a thought, and you can do this anywhere. If you have an area where you're not sure, like that first one, stitch your spine, draw your spine, whatever you want to do, chalk your first one on. If you don't like it, you can rub the chalk off and chalk it on again. Rub it off, keep chalking it until you like it. And then you can start using that one as your jumping board and then everything else should flow from it. Try that. You can also, um, and this works too. I, I teach this to my, uh, my rental customers when they come in, especially if, when we do the certification class and they've never used a long arm or um, if they're just, you know, they're new or they're not sure. You can absolutely, and we do it here, once we get them all set up with their um, pantograph, or if you're free motion quilting and you just want to get, you've doodled and doodled and doodled till you're, you know, but when you grab the machine, you're feeling a little nervous. Unthread the needle, take the needle out, turn the machine on, and ghost stitch. Get the feel for how the machine's going to feel when you're stitching those designs with the machine running because the machine feels different when the, when the needle is firing than um, if you're just sort of pushing the machine around or guiding the machine around, I should say. Um, unthread it, take the needle out, turn the machine on, and just move until you're warmed up and you're comfortable and you're like, okay, I'm, okay, I'm good now. Put the needle back in, thread your machine back up, then drop your drop your thread in your um, 
in your quilt. And then you've got that little bit of warm up time to get comfortable um, and get the feel for the machine at the size you want to do them, right? And like I've said before, it doesn't matter if you're drawing in a sketchbook that's 8 by 10 and you're learning these designs this big. When you get to the quilt, it, it's the same motion. And I know that you're writing with your hand and you're moving a machine with your two hands, it's still going to translate and transfer over to your quilting. Oh good. oh, good. Yay, questions. Thank you. Um, I always feel so weird when there's no questions. Um, Lisa asks, does this also work on a Sweet 16 sit-down? Lisa's asking if it also works on a Sweet 16 sit-down. Are you, Okay, Lisa, do you mean like, taking the needle out? and Because then at that point you're taking the needle out and you're moving your, your paper underneath your pen. Um, Yeah, because th when the needle is firing, you've still got the you've still got the feeling that things are moving. Try it. It's not exactly the same, obviously, as moving the machine around. Um, but I know when I had a George here, it still it felt different when the machine was running as when it wasn't. So I would give it a try. That's a good question. Um, this is P. Traber. Um, could you stitch into a corner and come back out? Yes, absolutely. When you get yourself into a corner, you can either echo any design. It doesn't matter what design it is. You can echo the design outward. If you're in a space and say you're doing a background filler and you get stuck in a corner, just travel in your ditch as far as you need to travel to get out into sort of open water and then just bounce back into your design. For sure. Um, if you change thread size, do you change the tension? Yeah. You're probably going to change needles too. Um, ooh, this, is a, this is a big discussion. So um, basically, lighter weight threads don't take can't handle as much tension on them as a heavier weight thread. Having said that, the goal with our machines is to have as, we need tension, but we want to have as little tension as possible on both the top and the bottom so that there's less stress on everything, right? Um, so if you switch out your thread on the top, you will want to do a tension check over, over on the side uh, or you can um, attach, this is one of the videos I wanted to make, um, you can attach a sandwich just to the side, like a, just a scrap sandwich to the side using those white C-clamps. You can pin it if you don't have the C-clamps, but um, I just use those white C-clamps that I use um, in my video, the panograph video where I line up my, um, my, seam my seams, keep my quilt straight. I don't know what's happening between my brain and my, my mouth something is off. Just give me one second. I'll breathe in. There we go. So you can practice out there or if you've got enough backing and batting you can plop a little piece of fabric down and just check your tension when you change. All right. Um, but definitely your tension is going to change. It's also going to change if you're say you're stitching with bobbins you've wound yourself. So fine 50 weight thread winding it yourself in your bobbin case. And then you switch to a different quilt and you put in, um, you've wound it yourself, but you're doing some artsy quilt or something and you're using really lightweight thread on the top. So you put a hundred weight thread in your bobbin case. You wind that on and you put it in. The difference in the tension on your bobbin case between the 50 weight so fine thread and the hundred weight polyester thread is like night and day. So you're going to have hardly any tension on that 100 weight thread with the same bobbin case that you just took the 50 weight out of. So you're going to have to loosen that tension off so it doesn't cause tension problems on the top. Does that make sense? It's like a, it's like a, a push pull or um, 
a tug of war basically and we want that stitch to be made right in the middle of the sandwich okay so yeah I think I'm gonna stop because I could talk about tension for hours and we don't have time tonight but we will do something with tension I promise um, <clears throat> Sherry wants to know when you're going to discuss threads Ooh, that'll be another live one or I may just do a video on threads because there's so many beautiful threads on the market um, and you know I use all kinds of threads I am not one of those people who sticks with only one brand one weight one type I use it all 40 weight cotton variegated 50 weight polyester 100 weight polyester all of it so that's something I'd really like everybody to get into because I see a lot on the you know the Facebook groups and the forums I never say anything because it's none of my business um, but I worry when people say oh my machine only likes this thread well your machines not human it has no feelings or opinions uh, you just have to m set the machine so that the threads can work properly within the machine right but you should be able to use all threads on all machines I didn't really answer that, did I? Okay. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah, we're good? Okay. We're good. That concludes our eight-week Monday night live demo experience. I've had a blast. Thank you to everybody who's shown up here every Monday night. And always says hi. Unfortunately, I never see the the live the live conversation feed. Lydia is sitting here; she sees it, and Jesse sees it too. Um, thank you to both of them. And uh, I will do another series. I really enjoy doing these, um, but it is coming into the. I know. Oh, happy Thanksgiving to all of our American friends. I know that's this week for you, um, but it's also coming into Christmas, and everybody's going to get really busy. So. I've got a few videos to create for everybody for the next, um, to cover us over into Christmas and into January. And then come January, we'll start up another series of live nights. I don't know if there'll be a Monday night or not. We'll have to decide. Um, but we will do it again. And then we can expand on what we're doing here and talk about a bunch of other stuff, all to do with long arming. And it'll be good. And as long as you're all willing to, um, be generous with your time and sit and listen to me. I will absolutely be happy to share what I know and help out flattening those learning curves for anybody who's having some trouble. And just play, play with the machines and play with thread and have fun. All right? So remember, I've got this booklet. Can't call it a handout because it's too big. Um, that's on the website, so if you'd like to get that. And there is an, an extra little bonus in there on the front page for anybody who gets it. You can read what's going on in there. And um, yeah, I think that's it. I'm probably going to remember. As soon as I hit that button, I'm probably going to remember something that I wanted to say. But it's escaped me at this moment. So we're good? No one else has any questions? All right. Doodle every day. Don't turn your sketchbooks, relax, have fun, change up the colors of your, your pens if you need to so you can look at pretty colors, and take the time. Take the time to throw some fabric on your machines, downtime, especially for those of you who quilt for a business. Just take the time to feed your creative soul, throw some fabric on, put on some really good music, your favorite color thread and just get lost in the process all right thank you everybody for coming I really appreciate it um, I appreciate all of you very much and I'm happy to do these have a great night have a wonderful holiday again to our American friends happy Thanksgiving and hit me up in the comments below make sure you subscribe check the bell icon all, all that YouTube stuff, all that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. That's fun, hey? It was good. Thank you. Bye, guys.
I have to push the button. <laughs>